Dorothea Puente was born Dorothea Helen Gray on January 9, 1929, in Redlands, California. She was the sixth of seven children, and her childhood is said to have been a traumatic one. Both her parents were alcoholics and were unhappily married. Dorothea's mother, Trudy May, was physically and emotionally abusive to her children and would frequently threaten to abandon them, while her father, Jesse James, would frequently threaten to commit suicide in front of Dorothea and her siblings. At the age of eight, Dorothea's father died of tuberculosis, a disease he developed after surviving a mustard gas attack during World War I. Her mother died a year later in a motorcycle accident, leaving the seven gray children orphaned. Dorothea ended up being sent to an orphanage until relatives from Fresno allowed her to come live with them. In later years, she would lie about her childhood, saying that she was one of 18 children who were all born and raised in Mexico. And as we explore later, lying would be a significant habit in her life. At 16, Dorothea left California and moved to Olympia, Washington. To earn money, she worked as a sex worker. During this time, she met a new client named Fred McFall, a 22-year-old soldier who served in World War II. Fred and Dorothea married in 1945 and moved to Nevada to start their new lives. Like her mother, Dorothea did not take to child rearing. She hated it. Instead of raising her children, she put one up for adoption and the other went to live with her parents. Fred, however, did not want to give his children up for adoption, so he decided to divorce Dorothea in 1948. On her own again, Dorothea moved to San Bernardino. She had little money, so she began stealing and committing crimes in order to build a lifestyle that she wanted. This unfortunately caught up with her when she ended up being arrested for trying to use a check under a fake name. Dorothea was sentenced to a year in prison, but she only served four months. While she was there, she refined her skills as a criminal, learning to pick pockets and practicing how to forge signatures. And then after her release, she fled the county to avoid the terms of her probation. By 1952, Dorothea remarried and settled down in Sacramento with her new husband, Axel Johansson. The couple's honeymoon period did not last long. Dorothea lied to Axel about her life and childhood. She spent money frivolously and was still involved in sex work. Much of this caused the marriage to sour. The two fought frequently, and Dorothea reports that Axel became physically abusive. For work, Dorothea claimed to be a holistic doctor. She was even treating neighbors for various illnesses. Her credentials, she alleged, came from when she grew up in Mexico and traveled between villages where she provided holistic care. But it serves as yet another example of Dorothea being a habitual liar. Court documents indicated that Axel had Dorothea committed to a psych ward in 1961. There, she was placed on antipsychotics. One source I found noted that she was also diagnosed as being a pathological liar with an unstable personality. Under the guise of a bookkeeping service, Dorothea opened a brothel. And although she was fairly clever in keeping her business's real activities under wraps, the brothel ended up being raided. Even though she was the mastermind of this operation, Dorothea was only convicted for being in a house of ill repute and ended up serving a total of 90 days in lockup. Dorothea and Axel finally divorced in 1966. While the couple's relationship was a toxic one, Dorothea later said while she was in prison for the murders that Axel would send her Christmas cards. She recounted that Axel was a good-hearted man very kind. He was good to me. In 1968, Dorothea met her third husband. She was 39, and her new husband, Roberto Puente, was 19 years her junior. 
Roberto was a Mexican immigre who is said to have only been interested in Dorothea for money and to achieve American citizenship. Roberto was also unfaithful during their marriage and the couple divorced not even a year later. On her own again, Dorothea decided to start an unauthorized rehabilitation program for alcoholics, as well as opening a boarding house in Sacramento. This new scheme was extremely successful and its philanthropic focus gave Dorothea access to elite circles. Dorothea claims that she spent time around governors like Pat Brown, Jerry Brown, and the incumbent U.S. President, Ronald Reagan. She recounts that while she was close to Reagan's first wife, Jane Wyman, she didn't get along with Nancy Reagan. While some of these encounters have been proven to have happened at the occasional charity event, little else can be confirmed on the nature of those relationships. Around this time, Dorothea got married for the fourth time to a man named Pedro Angel Montalvo. This marriage would only last one week after Pedro abruptly left their relationship. Then in 1978, Dorothea was arrested for fraud yet again. Although her boarding house brought in money, it wasn't enough to keep up with over two dozen tenants. In order to supplement her income, she would take the benefits checks of her tenants and forge their signatures, signing the checks over to herself. This time she received five years probation and was banned from operating a boarding house. Never being short of ideas to sustain herself, Dorothea worked as a home caregiver. She presented herself as a gentler, modest woman who was older than she was at the time. This disguise was to gain the trust of her elderly clients. She would rely on this for years to come, tricking many into believing that she was harmless, trustworthy, and innocent. Dorothea's first murder happened in 1982. Her victim was Ruth Monroe. Ruth and Dorothea had gone into business together. They had a catering company. In addition, Ruth would later move in with Dorothea. This would be her fatal mistake. Two weeks after moving in, Ruth began to feel ill. She could barely stand. Her son checked in on her. He noticed that she had declined quickly and that she was also drinking alcohol, something she never did. He thought that her drinking was odd, but he still trusted Dorothea given that she told him that she was a nurse. Ruth died soon after moving in with Dorothea. According to the coroner's report, her death was ruled a suicide caused by an overdose of codeine and acetaminophen. Ruth's family suspected that Dorothea poisoned her and their suspicions were heightened when they learned that Dorothea had stolen thousands from Ruth. The family, however, wouldn't confirm her involvement until much later when she was arrested for the murders at her boarding house. Sometime in the early 80s, Dorothea is said to have drugged three of her female clients with tranquilizers in order to steal their checks and valuables. This became a pattern. Dorothea began stealing from and sometimes drugging the people that she targeted. She ended up being arrested again in 1982. This would be her longest bid. Dorothea was sentenced to five years in prison at the California Institution for Women in Corona. Dorothea only served three years due to good behavior. Before being released, she was diagnosed with schizophrenia. The psychologist who evaluated her noted that this woman is a disturbed woman who does not appear to have remorse or regret for what she's done. She's considered to be dangerous and her living environment and or employment should be closely monitored. While in prison, Dorothea met 77-year-old Everson Gilmouth. The two became pen pals and upon being released, 
Everson met her outside the prison to pick her up in his red 1980 Ford pickup truck. Their relationship developed quickly and the two made plans to get married. Later that year, Dorothea hired a carpenter to do some work in her apartment. In order to pay him for this labor, she gave him a pickup truck, Everson's pickup truck. She said that Everson didn't need it anymore. She also asked the carpenter to build a six by three by two foot box and to transport the box, which she filled up and sealed to a storage unit. On their way to said storage unit, Dorothea made a change of plans. She had the carpenter to dump the box at a junkyard. And less than two months later, on January 1st, 1986, a fisherman spotted what looked like a coffin-shaped box near the river, which was near the junkyard. They discovered the decomposing body of an elderly man who wouldn't be identified until three years later. Dorothea, of course, continued to collect his pension and stayed in communication with his family, letting them know that Everson was ill and that's why they hadn't heard from him. In the meantime, Dorothea opened another boarding house, an action of which she had been banned from doing. This time, the house was located at 1426 F Street. The house could fit up to eight tenants at a time. Even though Dorothea's probation officers would visit her at her home, they never suspected that she was running this illegal business. They too were tricked by her lies and the kind facade that she presented. On November 11th, 1988, homicide detectives went to Dorothea's boarding house in search of missing person Alvaro Bert Montoya. Alvaro struggled with psychosis and had dealt with homelessness as a result of it. His social worker from Volunteers of America reported him as being missing after she could not get a clear answer from Dorothea regarding his whereabouts. Detectives searched the house and found nothing. During their search, a tenant reported seeing large holes being excavated and filled behind the house. And after digging around the backyard, detectives discovered a human leg bone and a decomposed foot. Dorothea was not immediately arrested. However, police did suspect that she was involved. Dorothea ended up fleeing before they could arrest her. With Dorothea gone, police went on to discover the remains of six other people. These people were in differing states of preservation and had been killed in various ways. Many had been found mummified. One victim was missing their hands, feet, and head, and two of them had been buried alive. The victims were identified to be four women and three men between the ages of 52 and 79. This included Leona Carpenter, Vera Faye Martin, James Gallup, Dorothy Miller, Benjamin Fink, Betty Palmer, and the victim who spurred the investigation, Alberto Montoya. Many of these victims ended up staying at Dorothea's boarding house because their social workers had referred them. Detectives later found that Dorothea had laced the food and drinks of her victims with a lethal mix of prescription drugs. Her reason for doing so was to fraudulently collect their social security checks, which by the time she was arrested had amassed to a payout of about 5,000 per month. Four days after fleeing, Dorothea was found in a Los Angeles motel. She was arrested and charged with a total of nine counts of murder. This included the victims found in her backyard, as well as the two other victims mentioned earlier, her business partner, Ruth Monroe, and her boyfriend, Everson Gilmouth. In preparation for trial, Dorothea was assigned to a psychiatrist, William Vickery. 
He diagnosed Dorothea with antisocial personality disorder. Dorothea's trial took place over the course of five months. More than 130 witnesses were called to the stand. Dorothea, however, did not testify on her own behalf. In addition, jurors found her to be emotionless during the proceedings. The prosecutor on this case stated the following during his closing argument. He said, does anyone become responsible for their conduct in this world? These people were human beings. They had a right to live. They did not have a lot of possessions, no houses, no cars, only their social security checks and their lives. She took it all. Death is the only appropriate punishment. The jury deliberated on their verdict for 24 days. They were torn. It was difficult for them to believe that this person who reminded many of them of their grandmothers could commit such heinous crimes. Ultimately, the jury convicted her of three of the nine murders, and she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Even though she had been convicted, Dorothea maintained her innocence. She argued that she was getting checks, that she didn't need to kill anyone. She said, why would I waste all my time to get these people cleaned up, make sure that they have no diseases, get all their affairs in order if I was going to kill them? Dorothea's home, where the murders took place, went on the market for sale in 2002. It was being sold as a fixer-upper. The owners who later bought the house allowed people to tour the inside for $10 to $15 with proceeds going to the Francis House Center as a way to give back to the community that Dorothea had once preyed on. The owners have also put up signs and mannequins depicting Dorothea. One sign reads, it was the awful, awful woman that did it. Don't blame me, signed the house. Dorothea Puente was housed at the Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla until her death on March 27, 2011. Dorothea died at 82. I found this to be an extremely interesting case. I learned about it from the Netflix trailer for the documentary, The Worst Roommate Ever. Dorothea had an awful childhood, which resulted in a lot of her bad behaviors over the years, committing fraud, lying, and manipulating people. But does it justify murder? Not only one murder, but the murders of nine victims. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Thanks for watching my video, and as always, be sure to subscribe to Prime Crime to learn about other interesting true crime cases.